Welcome to another edition of Critical Issues, Alternative Views. I'm Ron Kramer from the Department of Sociology at Western Michigan University, and I'll be the host for today's program. With me are a couple of the usual suspects, uh, usual viewmeisters. Uh, we have a special guest with us today also, but before I get to our special guest, let me introduce to my right Felix Brooks. Felix is the Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Kalamazoo Valley Community College and also now hand, handles international admissions, right? Correct, yes. All right. Uh, and on my far left, and usually he is on the far <laughs> left, is my friend Don Cooney. And Don is, of course, a professor in the School of Social Work at Western Michigan University, and he also moonlights as the vice mayor of Kalamazoo. Lots of things going on in the city right now. Yeah. And we have a special guest with us today who's no stranger to the program, Paul Clements. Paul's been on the program a number of times in the past. Paul's a professor in the political science department at Western Michigan University. And more importantly right now, he's the Democratic Party candidate for the 6th Congressional District in Michigan. And so Paul's right in the midst of a very busy campaign season, so we're glad you could make some time to stop by and be with us uh, today. My pleasure. So let's start off by just getting an overall view. How's the campaign going? Uh, how you're feeling right now? We're uh, what, eight weeks out or something yeah, like that. We've got so eight weeks to go. And weeks wow, to go. we've got a great team. Yeah, uh, we yeah. built a very strong campaign. We started uh, more earlier and stronger than ever before with yeah. our Get Out the Vote program. And you know, people out there as they're seeing the economy, it's just not working for most of us. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, uh, the, the Republican candidates, both for president and for Congress here, they just aren't addressing those questions. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling really optimistic. Okay, very okay. good. Very you good. just open the new campaign office? Yeah, we've got a new office uh, over in um, St. Joe. Okay. Uh, and we're tomorrow we're opening an office in Niles. So we're, we're building our, our infrastructure around the district. Of course, we've been had our office in Kalamazoo for quite some time. Right, yeah. right. But people need to realize the 6th Congressional District is, is a fairly large district. It goes over to the lake and yep. down to the Indiana yep. line. Kalamazoo County, all the way Van Buren, Berrien, uh, most of Allegan, mm -hmm. St. Joe, and Cass counties. Okay, so it's a pretty large Huge. district. Yep. You've got to cover a lot of ground. Doing a lot of talking, <laughs> a lot of driving around the district. It's a beautiful district. It's a great opportunity. Yeah. It's, it's terrific that you're opening up those satellite offices because that's, that's the tough part, the travel and getting out there and to have somebody on the ground there all the time. That just means so much. Yeah, we're working that's great. so hard on getting out the vote because, you know, that's, that's, that's the way we win is by getting mm -hmm. out the vote. That's the key. That's the key. Yeah. So what's different so far about this race compared to the last one? What are you seeing that's different? You know, what I'm seeing is both in, in my campaign in the national store uh, discussion is that there is so much of a better understanding today that the economy is just not working for most people. Um, the problem is that the real reason the economy is not working, the biggest reason for it, is a failure of Congress. Mm -hmm. But you know, people are feeling frustrated. They see government failing. They see the economy, the, 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 the corp big corporations, big business making enormous profits, uh, massive pay rises for the for the for the ch chief executive officers, but their wages are stagnant. Yeah. And the sad thing is that for a lot of people, this frustration, you know, they're saying, oh, well, who can solve this problem? And we've got this, this demagogue <laughs> saying, I can, I can, just only look at me, me. Only, only me, me, only me. And that's, but, but, but the reality is that we do have real challenges in this country. Um, we do have a, a, an economy where, where it, it's, it's, ri it's rigged. Um, and we need to turn that around. And this is, this is an election where we've got a real chance to move that forward. That's great. And you you that mentioned the Republican candidate. So I, I do want to ask you directly about your opponent's position on uh, Donald Trump, because we know that uh, there are many Republicans who have been running away from Donald Trump and see him as the disaster unfolding for their party. Uh, other Republicans have, you know, said, well, he's the candidate, so we have to support him. Reluctantly, perhaps, but we have to support him. Has Fred Upton said anything about Donald Trump? I don't remember hearing anything in the media. Has you he know, taken any position on the Trump candidacy? Fred is saying he doesn't want to talk about that. That's exactly <laughs> well, right. I bet he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, 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 he has he not endorsed Trump, 
but you know, I think we have to raise the question. We're talking about who's going to be the leader of our right. country, the leader of the free world. Do we want someone who, uh, who insults entire religions and entire ethnic groups? Do we want someone who, who encourages violence at their own, at their own rallies? Um, do we want someone who makes all kinds of claims without beginning to give the details about how they'll be carried out? And Upton has not been prepared to take a stand on that. That's right. And I think that's so important because uh, so many of the Republicans have come out and said, this guy is a real danger to the country. That's right. So um, I threw a couple of columns that David Brooks has written a column yeah, on and David a Brooks number of has. others saying, you know, they have a, a responsibility here um, to say, this guy's dangerous and it would hurt us terribly. Which is my follow-up question. Do you think his silence on this is actually an endorsement? I think that it has that effect. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because, I mean, it, it, it really, if you, if you really look at what he's saying and what the country needs and, and the positions that he would bring into the country, you have responsibility yeah, yeah. to speak out against yeah. that. You really do. Yeah. Right. You do. I don't think he can get off the hook. I think he has to take a stand, and I think he has to take a stand against it. Yeah, well, what we're seeing with Mr. Upton is he does not like to take stands. Oh. <laughs> we're no, seeing I, that time and again. Time and time yeah. again. I, I have often said on this program that I think Fred Upton lacks courage. Yes. He really lacks courage. He, he's afraid to stand up and, and take a stance when he thinks it might be a, a bit unpopular with the right wing of his party. Even if he, like, let's just take the climate change issue because, I mean, it's been well chronicled that Fred Upton believed that climate change was a real phenomena, and he at one point had something up on his website that said, well, everything has to be on the table to deal with this, right. this tremendous problem. And uh, then all of a sudden he gets challenged for the nomination uh, in his party, and then he uh, is scrambling to uh, take over as chair of the House Commerce and Energy Commission committee once mm -hmm. uh, once the uh, the Republicans took control of the of the House, and for in both of those battles, he was challenged by those on the far right in his party, and he gravitated that way and began to deny climate change, took down yeah. the stuff from his website, was listed by the Los Angeles Times, I believe it was, as the worst enemy of the uh, environment in <laughs> in the United States, and so. Uh, I think on, on this issue and, and a host of other issues, Fred just doesn't want to take a stand. He lacks the courage to step up to the plate and do what has to be done. And this is really critical because, you know, we should expect leadership from our leaders. Yeah. And the president of the talk has been talking about how, you know, the, the threats from climate change are really terrifying. Yeah. It's a very slow moving crisis, but it is an enormous crisis. And C Congressman Upton, that you know, he's chaired the most powerful position in the House of Representatives on climate policy. And he has consistently obstructed the president. He's uh, consistently obstructed forward movement on dealing with this enormously consequential matter. And he, he you know, you say he had the position. He, he, I think he really gets this, but it's just power. Mm -hmm. It's just, yeah. you know, how does, how does he stay in, in good graces with his party's leadership? whom what we're talking about is floods and droughts and um, you know, rising ocean, uh, 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 forest fires, all, all of these things increasing dramatically in the future. And if the Congress had stood behind the president, we would be far ahead yeah. of where we are today in addressing this issue. And Mr. Upton is the biggest reason in the House that we're not there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think that the, the 30 years he spent in office has just contributed to his tone deafness on this, you think? You know, it seemed like 30 years ago he thought for himself. But you look where he's That's been right. the last he did. few years. He did think for himself. And he has just gone along with the leadership of his party as they have become ever more ideologically extreme on issue after issue, and he's gone along with them. And obstructionist at that. And obstructionist, indeed. Yeah, I would think that, that one of the responsibilities of, of a leader, a congressperson, who um, has such a key position would be to try to get public support for what needs to be done. Um, but he has, he doesn't even want to speak about this, but you, Paul, have organized so much around the community to try to raise consciousness about climate change and what it means. And that's what Howard Wolpe did when he was the congressman. Mm -hmm. He would hold these community forums 
and try to raise consciousness about issues, the civil rights issue especially. Right. And um, you've done that so much in the past because that's a key position to really get support of the citizens to move on this issue. Right. But Fred doesn't want to touch that. Uh, you know, um, mentioning Howard Wolfe, I, I was honored to know Howard before he passed. Um, and I really appreciate that one of his major contributions in Congress was addressing the apartheid issue. Absolutely. And, and you know, making it so that American corporations couldn't be making investments that are uh, supporting the racist apartheid state. And that was my first political issue <laughs> when I was in college. Oh, as I was pushing geez. for the divestiture. I know you worked on that too, Todd, <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. So I sort of feel um, wow. a little bit of uh, um, in the same camp as, as, as Howard. Yes. But I think if we look at where we are today, that climate change is a similar issue. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. where who are the main victims of climate change? It's the poor, the, the marginalized, the people in the countries where they already have, you know, desert and drought. And they're the ones who are going to be suffering mm -hmm. the most. And, and I've been, you know, we've worked together at Western to, yeah. Western is, I think, one of the leaders in sustainability yeah. across the whole United States, across the world in terms of universities. Mm -hmm. And we've worked mm -hmm. together on raising consciousness and awareness and action, not just in terms of national policy, but, you know, we all know that Kalamazoo, our county, is a leader also in saying, how do we deal with these issues locally? Right. And I'm happy to have been a part of that that, you know, we can say growing movement. Yes. Yeah. yes. I was grateful that I got to introduce Bill McKibben. Yes. About 1,500 people um, that was a couple great. years back, our, yeah. our leading climate change activist. And we need to be taking much stronger action on this. Yeah. I should mention Paul was one of the leaders in creating our interdisciplinary study group on climate change, which we've now transitioned into our working group on climate change. And Paul was one of the leaders in getting that off the ground. And, We've, we've done a lot of great things, and bringing Bill McKibben here, I think, was one of our, our, right. our most important moves to, to see, you know, 2,000 people in Miller Auditorium listening to the foremost climate activists talking about the issue with such great passion was, was really great. And, and, and last year, um, led by people from that group, the university took a stand to get its resources out of the oil and gas and coal companies. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. We have like 1% of our investments in there, and they're not going to make any new investments in there. So that was all the fruit of the movement that you guys started on the campus and in the community. It was just great. Well, speaking of education, you, we were talking a little off camera before about your views on preschool. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. You know, I, I was mentioning before that people know there's real more serious economic insecurity. Um, than we've had, you know, for, for quite some time. We've, we've, been, we've seen considerable economic growth. We're talking about over 35 years, and almost all the benefits of that growth have gone to the top 5%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%. And part of, the, part of the flip side of that is that there have become more and more money in politics, more and more loopholes in our tax code, um, these, the way these people have gotten rich has not been through hard work and, and providing good products. It's been through playing the political game and getting special deals. Well, one consequence of that is we've not been making the investments that our country needs for a broad, inclusive economy, an economy that's really going to work for all of us. And one big area there is infrastructure, our roads, our water system. We see that in Flint. But I think maybe the biggest area is really education. And, and if, if I'm in Congress, then I am certainly going to work at every level of education to dramatically improve it because that's what our country needs. And here, the low-hanging fruit, the, the obvious first move, is with just really good quality preschool available to every child. I mean, here in Kalamazoo, um, we've, we've seen that and that the foundations have stepped up with our Young Fours program, but it shouldn't have to be the foundations and, you know, uh, um, charitable impulses to give people what we really need. Uh, the study, Tim Bartik at, at Upjohn Institute, yeah. he's done these studies that show that the payback is between eight to 15 times for every dollar you put in wow. to good, good quality mm -hmm. preschool, not just any preschool, good quality yeah. in terms of better performance in school, less juvenile crime, better economic performance down the road. And I think the country is ready to do this. But good preschool has to be just a start. We've got to do better in K through 12. We need to have affordable, at least debt-free, if not free public university. And we need to do much better in vocational 
um, training people for the jobs that are out there, retraining people when they lose a job mm -hmm. for, the, for the jobs employers need. There's so much opportunity here, and the failure of our Congress is the biggest single reason that we're not moving forward here. Yeah, yeah um, so many of those things you're, you're hitting right on target for. Um, there are a lot of jobs around here. There are, yes. And then they can't get people to fill those jobs. I've talked to many employers here in, the, in Michigan 6th mm -hmm. District who, who want to hire someone, but they don't have the qualified applicants. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and the, you know, that doesn't start when the jobs become available. It starts right. way before that, right. like you're right. saying, and getting people ready for those things. Um, and that's, that's where we've really failed people. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, we, two areas, I think, that first of all, we have to prepare people for jobs and make sure they have the skills that they can do those jobs. The second thing is that, that we have to make sure that they get living wages because two-thirds of the families in Kalamazoo that are in poverty have somebody that's working, yep. and they're not making enough to support their family. So those areas we have to work on. And, and that, that means getting people living wages, but it also would mean the things you're talking about, getting social supports out there. Um, Ron always talks about social supports, reduce crime with lack of social supports, increase crime. But childcare um, and transportation and those other kinds of things that the government has just withdrawn uh, from the support of people, all those kind of things we have to get Congress to get, move on. You, you know, Don, m my sister has, has six kids, and after the sixth one was born, the, the father was not around to raise them. So she raised those six kids on the earned income tax credit right. and, on, mm -hmm. and on food stamps, and I'll call it SNAP. Okay, well, here in Kalamazoo County, we have 20% of our kids who go to school hungry sometime during the year. And Congressman Upton has voted for continued cuts in food stamps. You look at the, the Ryan budget, one of the most regressive budgets we've seen in our country's history that Upton has supported four times, and that would strip away the resources from the very programs that provide these supports that allow people to engage effectively in the economy. Now, I'm grateful my sister, that their kids went to Kelvin Public Schools, so they were able to go right. tuition free right to um, University of Michigan, to Western Michigan University, to Michigan State. But that's you know, because of the good luck of Kalamazoo, the yeah, Kalamazoo right. promise. Yeah. Yeah. We need this across the district and across the country. Right, exactly, exactly. We all know, we all have students in college, and we see that how these guys are handicapped right. with the terrible debts that they're right. taking on. That's unconscionable. It really shouldn't be happening. And, and I'm proud that Hillary Clinton has followed Bernie Sanders' lead yes. on this. Yes. And she has said, we need to have free public university for families with up to $125,000 per year income. And let's go there. Oh, great. That would be terrific. It's a huge difference. So. You know, I'm teaching uh, two classes this semester on social policy. So what I'm doing in my classes to begin the semester is I'm showing a Michael Moore's film. Who should we invade next? Which is all about social policy in other countries. And the, the, the students in my class are looking at it and saying, well, what? how come we can't do that? I mean, what's the deal? Why can't we do that? We got more resources than those guys, but we're not doing it. And of course, we could. We yeah, could. We could. <laughs> There's no reason. I was in Berlin for a conference last year, and you know, students, uh, college students in Germany go to, to, go to school for free. The, the state funds the higher education and uh, doesn't seem to be hindering Germany's economic growth at all. Because <laughs> they, they, they recognize what the long-term payoff of that education will be. Yeah, yeah. You know, makes a huge difference in terms of the economic stability. Right. And, and I've been talking about a lot of these issues in the campaign trail. And a lot of the times when I raise them, a question people ask is, well, how are you going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's a very appropriate question. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's start off with removing the um, uh, interest deduction that allowed uh, our, our previous presidential candidate, what's his name, Mitt Romney, to pay 15% yeah, right. on his income uh, when, when we're paying much more than that. So, so if, you, if you make your income through big investments, you pay the same rate of tax than the rest of us. That'll get an enormous amount. Let's, let's follow what Bernie Sanders proposed and what we see in the United Kingdom, a big financial uh, center 
that, if, that let's put a very small tax on financial transactions so the speculators who are playing Wall Street, who are playing the stock market, so there's a little disincentive to playing those games that really helped us yeah. help to trash the economy back in 2008. Yeah. And that alone would give the resources for public universities, for, for pre, pre public universities. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. Let's, you know, we, now's the time we need to be strengthening Social Security, not weakening yeah. it. Let's raise that cap. You know, why is it that you only pay Social Security tax on the first 118,000? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's raise that cap, and that will allow us to strengthen Social Security. Um, there are, because there's been so much money in politics for so long, our tax system has more holes than Swiss yeah. cheese. Oh, you know, boy. we see Upton yeah. supporting um, subsidies for oil and gas industries, which are huge. Uh, which, which are huge. huge. If that, they don't, that they don't need. What that right. they don't that need. They don't need. Yeah. The reason we don't have the money to make the investments that are make our economy work for all of us is because people are scamming the system. Yeah. We need to get rid of those loopholes. We'll have the resources to make these investments so we can actually have the supports that allow people to participate actively mm -hmm. in the economy, do the work to improve their conditions. Right. I think that's an excellent answer. The money is there. This right. nation yeah. is by right. far the, the wealthiest country in probably in history right. and, and it's just lopsided in how that money right. is allocated. I mean, we're seeing corporations create, create value, make their profits here in the United States. They go and park these profits, you know, in Ireland or the Bahamas yeah. or someplace and don't pay the tax on it. Uh, I mean, we, we can get rid of that. We can turn that one around. And the, and the problem we've dealt with for the last what, 30 years is the people that have swallowed that, you know, the Kool-Aid that Reagan doled out about the fact that we pay too much in taxes. Yeah. And that's, that's been part of the narrative that it's just sort of polarized us and fixed us in place. So people think we have to pay for anything like, don't I pay too much already? No, actually you don't. <laughs> And, and, right. and the right. point is that we pay among the lowest yeah. tax rates of any industrialized yeah. country, and it's been because of all this money in politics that the very wealthy have gotten out of paying the taxes that in other places they would normally be expected to pay. And, and I think there's solid research that shows that most people do not oppose paying taxes right. on no. two conditions. Number one, that they think the tax system is fair which is obviously not at the current moment. It's not a fair tax system, mm -hmm. but if the tax system is fair, people don't mind paying taxes. And second, if they know that their tax money is being used well, in a sound way to right. make the kind of investments. And I think that's a critical term, investment, to see governments has a, a responsibility to make investments that improve the future for all citizens. That's what you're talking about in a variety of different ways. Right, right. If people are convinced that the tax system is fair and that government is going to use that tax money to make sound investments to improve the economy, to improve the society, then they're willing to support them. But, okay, this, I need to take a populist moment here, <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, who is it that's not paying the taxes? It's not the 99% no. no. of our citizens right. of, of Michigan's 6th right. District. It's mostly the very wealthy, the big corporations that have used their political power, the power of their money, to buy off the politicians yeah. and get those breaks and loopholes. And so we're not talking about raising taxes for, 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 for the majority of citizens. No, we're right. talking about the people who should have been paying it, but who've got out of it one way or another. Pay their fair share, yeah. Right. I mean, uh, Trump will not reveal his, his tax expenditure. Right. Why does he not want to, right. you know, like, like every other presidential candidate in the last yeah. 40 years, let us know what his tax return looks like. Why and not? Come on. Nicholas Kristof said that he got a chance to see his tax return, I don't know, 10 years ago, and that year he paid zero taxes. Zero taxes. Right. And I think that's what he was afraid of, that when, of it, when, it, all, when, yeah. it, when it all comes out in the wash, right. he's going to be paid very little, if right. nothing, and taxes. Yeah. And, and you know, there are quite a few millionaires and billionaires like Mr. Trump exactly. who are in the same, yeah. <laughs> playing the same game. Yeah. And, and that's the tax fairness issue that, right. yes. uh, that we're talking about here. And so, yes, people perceive that unfairness that, yeah. that the oh. system is rigged right. Uh, right. for the 1%. And I think it helps overall then to, uh, you know, it, it redounds then to, uh, you know, government in general, that, yeah. that people's right. attitudes, their anti-government attitudes yeah. are reflected partly because of that unfair tax system. And we've seen Bernie talking about that throughout the last couple of years. We've seen Pope Francis oh. yeah. talking about that, yeah. that we need a fairer system. Right. Um, we've seen Hillary Clinton moving in that direction in many areas. Um, we, if you look at the, at the Democratic 
the, the platform of the De Democratic Party that was approved in Philadelphia um, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, it's the most progressive platform we've ever had for, 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 in, for any party mm -hmm. in this country. And by contrast, the Republican Party is one of the most regressive. Really? The, the, yeah. the difference between those two, where everything from um, uh, the, making the, the people pay their fair share of taxes, move to tax fairness, investments mm -hmm. in education, um, uh, the Republicans, they want to turn Medicare into a voucher program. Oh, yeah. They want to raise the, air, the age of accessibility to Medicare for the Democratic platform. That's say, let's reduce it to 55. Yeah. You can get Medicare when you're 55 yeah. years old. We need to be strengthening Medicare, not, not weakening it. Yeah. With the Affordable Care Act, this is just so sad that the Republicans in Congress, 55 times, they vote to defund oh, the Affordable Care Act when they're not willing to work with the president to see how to fix, yeah, it has some problems, yeah. but if you're not gonna work to fix them, there are 20 million people, who, some of my friends, who have ins health insurance for the first time. Are we gonna take that away from them? Yeah, right. From those 20 million people? It is not going to happen. It's just impractical, yeah. but they're not willing to talk across the aisle about how we make those improvements so we really do get good, affordable, accessible health care and Mr. Upton, my opponent, is um, one of the people who has been, you know, uh, just not preparing to, to play this, not preparing to have this discussion. Right, right. And, and that's true of so many of the issues that we face. I mean, um, he just punts, he doesn't deal with them. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, we've, we've seen he, his part. But he punts on first down. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were talking about this before our, our, the show started here, that, that when the president was elected, that the Republicans in Congress said that they were going to try to block him. Right. That they yeah. were going to work to solve the challenges, to, to pass yeah. the laws that the country needs. They were going to try to make Ms. The, Ms. President Obama a one-term president, which obviously failed, but yeah. somehow they seemed to keep it up, yeah. that if the president was for it, they were going to be against it. And we haven't had working together that is what the country so badly needs to address a whole host of issues. We've had one of the most ineffective Congresses, the most ineffective in my memory. Yeah. Oh, most yeah. definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. And again, there's just an awful lot of uh, writing out there from political analysts, some of whom work for conservative uh, think tanks like the, the Heritage Foundation or the American Enterprise Institute, which, you know, Thomas Mann and, and Norman Ornstein yes. have yeah. their book, you know, it's worse yeah. than you think. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, their analysis is that the Republican Party has become the most extremist party in American political history. Wow. That they have moved so far to the right and they have become so obstructionist and so extreme in their views uh, that this is unparalleled in American history to have one political party go that deep off the far end. And of course what that means is that we've had con gridlock, that Congress yeah, is unable gridlock. to get anything done because one party the party that actually controls the, the House and the Senate, the both, both chambers, uh, is so far extremist and refuses to cooperate with the Democratic Party or with the President to get anything done for the American people. Right. And the American people suffer because of this extremism. And, and you know, during World War II, the, the Congress was busy, had a lot to work on during World War II. I think there was a period there when they didn't pass so many bills. But since World War II, there has been no Congress that has passed fewer bills wow. than yeah. the present Congress. What you say? I said, you know, and it's, and it's across the board. You know, you, you look at the judicial nomination yeah, process. Yeah, right, exactly. That's ground to a halt. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. There's no effort to solve the country's problems. The country's problems are deep, and they're getting worse, and there's really no serious effort to deal with them. The one thing that these guys care about is getting reelected. That's all they care about, can, can, holding that power. Yeah. So no wonder that Trump resonates with so many people because he's right on the idea that this system is not working. Right. And, um, but that's just a starting point. We, we have to yeah. move in a, in a direction to make it work. But you know, I, I teach national economic development. I teach about the economic development of many countries around the world. And one thing you see is that when things are really bad, and they are bad right now, that that often turns into a time of real opportunity. And I think we may be around, about to turn that corner that people see that we've got to fix education. We've got to fix our infrastructure. Yeah. We've yeah. got to increase produ production of goods in this country. Our, our, our federal government, particularly our Congress, but our federal government, it has been failing us. 
But if we, if we, there's a chance to really turn this around. There's a chance to address so many of these issues, um, I think. I think there are a lot of Republicans who realize that having the Congress with the popularity below a cockroach is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if we get a few changes of, of personnel right, in Congress, right. we've got a chance to really move this country forward for an economy that's going to work for all of us. I, I, I think that's right. I, yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. There's an opportunity here. There it is. really is. Yeah. 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 Um, we got to seize it. That's the thing. Yeah. So what, what um, I'm seeing now that um, there's a very good chance that the Democrats might get control of the Senate. Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah. And then they're moving up in the idea of the House, too. It's, right. it's a long way to go in the House, but it's much improved from where it was, the opportunities, the you know, chances. There are quite a few national political analysts who are saying there is a real chance that the House could turn this year. We could have a Democratic House you know, uh, from January. I mean, it's early days yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Something. Gee. That would be... Uh that would be an enormous turnaround. Wouldn't it be an enormous, yeah. what's it, 46 seats or yeah, something? something like that. Yeah, something yeah. 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 wow. But I think that what, what we need is, is about 23 or 24 seats to turn that. Ah. So. Yeah. Wow. Great. And here's got to be one of them right here. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Paul, have, um, uh, has uh, your opponent called you and asked for debates yet at all? Or? You know, funny you should ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when, when I ran in 2014, he, he agreed to debate me, but then he pulled out at the last minute, 24 hours before he pulled out. And this time, um, the League of Women Voters has been asking him, you know, uh, over in, in Berrien County, will he come and debate? And he's not re responded to their request. My campaign manager is talking to his campaign manager, will, will, are we going to have a debate? And he hasn't responded. So he doesn't want to talk about Trump, and he doesn't seem to want to talk to the citizens of his district about what what so, his priorities are. So why do you suppose are. that's the case? Why doesn't he want to debate? I think he's afraid that if people ask him about his real positions, that they'll see that he's hurting their interests in area after area. That he'd like to present himself as a moderate, but as his party has become more extreme. The Republican Party in Congress mm -hmm. have, has left so many Republicans behind. And he's gone right along with them. And he doesn't like, he doesn't want to let people figure that out right. by answering the questions mm -hmm. about his votes, about what he has stood for, how he has represented us, Michigan 6th District, in the U.S. Congress. He doesn't want to talk about that and ask, ask, answer questions either to the media or to you know, the candidate from the other side, which is how our democracy is supposed to work. Right. So, so my follow-up question has been is, how has the media covered that, his si relative silence on that? Well, I will tell you that when I had my first, when I, when I just, uh, said I'm going to be running again. My first interview was with WKZO, our local radio station. And their first question was, gosh, Congressman Upton didn't debate you last time, did he? Is he going to debate you this time? So I don't know. It's you know, maybe I'm, the media will pay with, attention. With the, with the papers in Berrien County and some of the other out, outlying counties, what, what have they said? Have they been silent on this as well? well? So far they've been silent. But let's be clear that, that this, is just, this is just becoming apparent that in terms of the normal schedule of things, now mm -hmm. would be the time that you'd be getting these things on yeah. the schedule. And so before we were waiting, thinking maybe yeah. it would happen. But now, now is when, if you're going to schedule it, now's the yeah. time to do it. And it's not happening. So now's the time for um, him to be held accountable for not responding to the voters. Right. Shame on us if we let him get away yeah. with that. We can't let that happen. He has to face the people. He has an obligation to. No, he know? has an absolute obligation. And he, he will do everything he can not to do that, not to, to face you. Um, and he'll want to debate you in a, an area that's completely safe for him and where nobody can show up or something. But we can't let him do that. I mean, when I ran, um, the local media organized the first debate. Right. And um, it was at the public library, and we packed the place. You would remember that. And uh, that's got to happen again. We have to do that. Um, we have to get them out. We deserve to hear both sides yeah, of what people stand for. Yeah, Felix, you're right that someone running for Congress has an obligation to respond to the people, to respond to their opponent, yeah. because otherwise democracy doesn't work. Right. Exactly. Yeah, our, your first obligation is always constituent service, and then an election, that would be 
paramount in my mind that that's, that you would do to let your voters know this is where I stand. This is this is the contrast between me and the person that I'm running against. Yeah. And, and if we don't have, if they're not answering questions, they're not accountable. Yeah. Right. They're not accountable to, to the people they're supposed to be representing. And without accountability, democracy does not work. He has every advantage in, in so many ways. One way he has an advantage is that he can send a letter, um, uh, uh, his report from Congress to every single member of the district here. Right. And, and that's worth hundreds and hundreds of dollars, probably thousands. But he does that for nothing because he, he's a congressperson. And he's only allowed to do that up to so many days before the election. But he'll do that. He'll send that out and contact every single person in the district. The second thing is, I mean, he was on television last night on Channel 3 um, talking about his visit to Flint. He doesn't have to take any stands against anything that we're talking about here, just say the Flint thing is terrible, and he gets on television uh, for an extensive, and, and they treat him so softly, they don't really go after him on anything. But he can do those kinds of things that gets him in the media um, and then people see him and think that he's really doing some kind of things. And now that the election comes up, he likes to talk about Flint. He likes to talk about Zika. Mm -hmm. But he's done nothing to get action by his party. Nothing has happened in Congress. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the fact that nothing, his party is in power, he has yeah. not used, he's one of the most powerful people, chairs of House Energy and Commerce Committee, one of the very powerful committees. He could have moved action forward on this if he'd wanted to, but he has failed to do that. But that's not his only, I'm going to say, unfair advantage. That Congressman Upton is one of the top recipients of yeah. out-of-state corporate political action committee money in the House of Representatives. You know, I'm raising my resources from citizens of this country. Right. Mr. Upton is raising the overwhelming majority of his res resources from political action committees of the companies in the very sectors that he regulates. And they don't give this money out of the kindness of their hearts. Right. They get payback right. for this. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very important point. He, he's getting, he, who's he getting the money from? Who he's getting money from the oil and gas industry, from the pharmaceutical industry. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been talking about this EpiPen thing. Yeah. All right. Well, Congressman Upton voted for the bill that blocked Medicare from negotiating drug prices, oh. pharmaceutical prices, Hard. with the pharmaceutical right. companies. He voted for the bill that blocked the importation of, of generic drugs from Canada. If we had these things, the, the price across the board mm -hmm. of our, of our um, pharmaceutical products, of our drugs and medicines, would be much lower yes. than what it is today. Yes. And then he says, okay, we've got to worry about EpiPen. This is, yeah, let's worry about it. But he created the system that led to this problem. And, and it's a very mild bill that he's introduced. He's right. saying, in the future, companies right. can't do this. Right. He's not really doing anything about the, the current situation with EpiPen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what do you think about um, winning young voters to get out there? I mean, that seems to be a big challenge. A lot of young people um, are just saying, I don't want anything to do with it. I, I was in Philadelphia for the early part of the convention, and um, there were a lot of people, not a lot, but I saw signs that said, um, Plan A, Bernie. Plan B, Jill. And um, uh, some people who were working with Bernie are going to be moving towards uh, Jill Stein and the Green Party. But other people, young people, are, are just sort of dropping out of the whole thing. And I, I think that's dangerous. It's terribly dangerous. It, it, it really is dangerous. But I'll tell you that um, I have been working with young people uh, throughout my campaign for, for a year and a half now. and. Um, particularly with the young people who, who have been excited about Bernie. Now, yeah. you may remember that Bernie Sanders won Michigan, and he got 60% of his winning votes for Michigan in Michigan's 6th District, wow. right here wow. in Southwest Michigan. Wow. Well, yeah. I was the person who um, was the opening speaker for Bernie's yeah. rally. Oh, so. Bernie has en endorsed me. He endorsed me in 2014. He's endorsed me again. I've spoken at most of the Bernie events here in Kalamazoo. Bernie, you know, he, Bernie, He's got a real vision, but he's also a pragmatist. He knows that it really matters who runs our country. Absolutely. Yeah. So he was responsible for giving us the most progressive democratic platform in our nation's history. And now he's saying, look, we've got to make sure we have a president who's going to be responsible and reasonable, not an egomaniac. And there's only one choice. So he's, yeah. so he's working for that. But he's also want to keep building his movement. And his new organization, he's calling it Our Revolution. Yeah. 
All right, they're picking 100 candidates around the United States who represent Bernie's values at all levels of government, school board, city council, uh, county commission, uh, um, Congress. Well, so far they've picked one candidate in Michigan to get behind, and that's Paul Clements. Wow, I'm the one great. candidate. Wow. So I guess in a certain way you could say I'm kind of representing Bernie's revolution right, here okay. right now. Okay, that's great. That's great. But that's the point great. is that this election is ex extraordinarily consequential for the young people. Absolutely. Uh, you know, Absolutely. Uh, for the for the kids we're yeah. teaching, at, for the young people we're teaching yeah. at Western, yeah. um, for the young people uh, across the district and across the country. And we have built a strong foundation for getting out that vote. There's going to be very strong efforts to register students at Western. Um, I've been talking with students a lot already, and that's going to continue all the way through. Because do they want to have jobs? Do they want to, to have you know, reduction of interest rates? Because unfortunately, many of them have loaded up a lot of debt. Do they want to have reduction of interest rates on that debt? Do they want to have retraining in case they have to get a new job down the road? Do they want to have free child care? Do they want their kids to get good preschool when, if and when they have kids? Do they want Social Security to be there for them yeah. when they get to be of age? This, is, this, this, this election is going to determine the answers to many of those questions. And um, you know, I think that we've got a real good chance of having a much stronger youth turnout, young That's turnout, great. than we've seen in recent years. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. We need that real bad. Right. How do we move how do we move forward on the whole Middle East situation? I mean, that is such a tough one. Because if we were starting now, we it would be a lot easier to determine what's going to be our policy in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. But right now, when we're so in ingrained in it, so deep into that, what, what do you see as ways to start moving on that? Well, I mean, the Middle East is, 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 is a mess. Um, you and I remember that we opposed the invasion of Iraq. <laughs> that was a bad <laughs> we idea. Were yeah. We were there. We were right? there. But, but um, the things that that invasion, invasion of Iraq set in motion um, have now led to unprecedented conflict in, in the Middle East. And, it's, and, it's, and there are so many different forces going against, against each other. It's, it's a very complicated situation. All right, and uh, the unfortunate reality is that there are, there's no silver bullet. No, that there is there is no there is no easy answer. Right, there is not. Now we right. have one of our presidential candidates who says he's going to take the oil away oh, from ISIS. All right, and the only way you do that is by sending boots in on the ground. And I think we've seen from the ex experience of Iraq that that just does not work. And if we have a militaristic well. attitude, yeah. that that's not going to work. You're going to say something. I said in Afghanistan as well. You know, <laughs> right? That, yeah, that, that, that exactly. approach just doesn't work. No. The big footprint no. hasn't hasn't served us well at all. You know, no. we have finally got a deal with Iran that yeah. moves a, moves away from them moving towards a nuclear option. We have a chance to continue to work with Iran on issues like security in in Syria. Um, but if Trump is elected, he's saying he wants to trash that treaty. Um, and that, that's, uh, that'll just be one more thing that will exacerbate conflict in this such critical area. You know, we certainly, I don't see a role for, for the, the army, you know, for our regular forces yeah. to go into the Middle East at this stage. We need to continue working with our allies, that, that Turkey, um, they don't want to see states collapsing around them. Right. Um, it makes an enormous difference to them. The Kurds, they've been working very hard. We've got to continue to work with them, with the relatively moderate forces and just uh, build a, a, a perimeter of, of security, mm -hmm. of, of um, moving towards, you know, hopefully uh, respect of human rights. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's going to take time, but, yeah. I, but, but I think that's the way to, to move forward. Yeah. Well, in, in retrospect, you know, we were and, and, and perhaps should have been big supporters of the Arab Spring, but had we knew that this was going to be the consequences, do you think we would think differently about that now? I think that, that here, here is a point where I do agree with Hillary, and that is that um, on, on the military side, that we should have, that it would have been, we see in retrospect, with the, you know, 2020 hindsight, mm -hmm. that, that stronger support for the moderate forces in Syria four years ago that she was promoting um, would in all likelihood have uh, led to a better situation today. Not, 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 not sending army in to mm -hmm. support them, but, but building them up. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right that, that there's no quick answer here. Unfortunately, this is going to be, uh, but there's no military solution to it. It has to be 
diplomatic, it has to be human rights, it has to be supporting the positive forces in that area, and that's going to be a, a huge amount of time. Right. Uh, but it, I think that's the only way to move forward. Yeah. The easiest thing to do is to say, we're just going to send in troops. We're the most powerful nation in the world. We're going to go in here and do that. Uh, that didn't work so well in Vietnam. It didn't work so well in other places, no. and it's not going to work well here. It hasn't worked well here. So it's this terrible situation that we're in. We have to slowly get out of it. I think you're 100 percent right. right on yeah. that. We have to beware of simplistic solutions. Yeah. Oh, uh, right, which, right. Which is what yeah. Trump offers. Right? Yeah. Simplistic solutions that have no thought behind them and and uh, no no chance to be successful. Uh, and that's when he offers any any ideas at all. Most of the time, it's, yeah. there's nothing there. And no details. There's, yeah. there's no, no there there. <laughs> and it reminds me of the whole Donald Rumsfeld thing. No, will we agree to just liberate as well? It's a little bit more complicated than oh that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, boy. You know, one of the things about Donald Trump that, that really, it, he's really right on, they don't care what he says. I mean, he's, he, he, he could say the most crazy things in the world, as he does, but he doesn't lose support. I mean, his supporters are with him because they're so disgusted with the existing system that he's standing against the system, so they're with him. And there are real dangers in this. Yeah. You know, oh, he's talked about, about Putin being a better leader yeah. than Barack Obama. Oh, well, let's God. see what does Putin do. He invades Crimea. He restricts press freedoms. If someone speaks against him, he throws him in jail in, in many occasions. And is that the role model that Donald Trump is going to use for, 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 for serving as a president? Could you imagine the firestorm if, if a, a, a candidate Obama running for office had said the same thing about oh, Putin? Oh, my goodness. You know, could you imagine the firestorm that would have, would have ensued? Right. But again, right. Trump says that, and he, and he seems to be able to get away with it. You know? away with it. Yeah. People say, this is, this is crazy. The responsible people say, this is crazy, but it doesn't affect his, where he stands. Yeah. Well, let's, let's continue with Trump and his craziness for a, a bit more here. One of the main issues that Trump has uh, been focusing on is the immigration issue, oh, which is yeah. an important issue and a serious issue. So um, how do we deal with this issue? It's a very explosive issue. Uh, Trump seems to be gaining a lot of ground by ramping up fears about immigrants and threatening to build walls and deport people in massive uh, quantities. What, what's a sensible way to approach the immigration issue? Well, I think the first point there has to be that we have 11 million people who almost, in, almost all of them have been living in a law-abiding way and contributing to our economy, part of our communities. And Trump has said he wants to send them all home, yeah. send them all back to Mexico or, or wherever they came from. And he's gone back and forth on that. Right, That's right. one of the issues where he says one day he says one thing, one day he says something yeah. different. But if we were to do what he says, that would, that would not only that don't be, be terribly uh, destructive to so many families and communities, it would also ha have an enormous cost to our economy. Oh, my right. goodness. Um, it, right. would be, it, it, would, it, would, it could only be carried out through moving towards a police state, and it would be extraordinarily expensive, oh, so we wouldn't have the resources for all the basic things the government needs to be doing. But the other side of that is, that most of these people who've been law-abiding, they need to be incorporated into our, into our communities in, in a way where they can, they can operate, where they can have education, where they can have a, um, uh, an economic, participate economically. And I think that that means we're talking about pathway to citizenship. Yes. Um, yes, we need to be sure that we control our borders. Yeah, we need to, you know, we have rules and we need to enforce those rules, but we're a nation of immigrants, and we have been enriched by our diversity in the past, and that's where we are today. And that's my question. To me, the fundamental question is a, is a question of what our values are, and our values as a society that we've always espoused is that we're an inclusive society. Right. Yeah. And so Trump's stance takes us and turns that, turns that right on his head. And Trump, in, in area after area, have been, has been divisive, has been trying to set one group against yeah. another, has been... Um, again, you know, saying that, okay, we're, we're not going to allow people from, from, uh, from Muslims to come to the country or people from an entire country to come to the country without, um, in, in, when, he, when he gets into office. Um, yeah, and right. we, ne we need to be a country where we work together to solve our problems, yeah. to build our economy, to be the example of democracy that, work, that works for all of us in, in the 21st century. 
and Trump would take us in the opposite direction. I mean, we have a, roughly a, about a million students that come into this country, international students come into this country every year. And a lot of those country, students come in from countries that, that, that are Muslim-leaning countries. So what are we going to do? We're going to close the speakers on that as well? Oh, I, I have quite a few Muslim students in my classes yeah. that I teach. Yeah. And you know, many of them are, are great students. Because yeah. Yeah, I've, been, I've been getting asked that question by my yeah. students from Saudi Arabia a lot over the yeah. last couple weeks. Are we going to be able to stay here uh, if, Trump, yeah. if Trump gets elected president? Yeah. And what do I tell them? Tell him Trump can't yeah. get elected president. <laughs> I mean, Trump is threatening to not, not stand by our NATO allies, yeah. to not abide by the treaties that our country has been a part of, that, that we set up for, for over so many years. Um, you know, uh, the, the amount of uncertainty that, he, that would be generated if he were to become mm -hmm. president, the status of the different international uh, organizations that, that we've been a part of for so long would all be thrown into question. Yeah. And that comes back to full circle to what I said earlier. Your opponent's silence on this, to me, just reeks of an endorsement. Because yeah. he knows all this narrative is out there as well. Right. Well, and yet he doesn't say anything. It, what we're saying is, is who is going to be the leader of our country? And if Trump is the leader, it, it raises enormous risks for our country and for the globe and for, for a responsible member of Congress, not, I mean, a, a responsible member of Congress has to take a position yeah. on that. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Another area um, is the whole area of violence in the country. Yeah. And I mean, you, uh, we've been getting a lot of publicity about uh, Chicago and seeing what's happening in Chicago. But I learned yesterday that Chicago's fourth that there are three other cities that have a higher percentage of people being shot and killed in, in this country. Baltimore's yeah, first, Baltimore. St. Louis right. is up there, and I'm not sure if it's Detroit that's third, I'm not sure who it is. But um, I, I, something has to be done to try to give young people hope, yeah. to give them something that they can hold on to, or else we're just gonna have more of this kind of thing. Years ago, uh, you looked at um, violence as a public health problem. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. we're going to have to look Deborah at Deborah Prothero Stiff, Deborah remember we brought Prothero her here Stiff. to talk about yeah. that particular yeah. issue. Yeah. 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 And again, this, this, this comes back to what we've been talking about from the very beginning of our discussion today. And that is to say that the failure of Congress has meant that we're right. not making the investments in, in things like education, but it's also in social supports that, that, that allow everyone to have a real chance yeah. of making economically. And so we do have many communities in our society where kids growing up don't think they have a future. Right. And most of that impact, unfortunately, f disproportionately falls on students and people of color. It certainly Absolutely. does. And, and so that has to be part of the debate as well. One thing we've not talked about is our criminal justice system, you know, where we have far and away, 25% of the people in prison around the world are in prison in the United States. Unbelievable. Yeah. And that's not right. Oh. And that's not right. We have, we have, we've got 2% of our, of our adult population in prison or parole or whatever. We've been, and there are many people who got there off drug offenses. There are many people who have mental health challenges who find themselves in prison for one reason or another. And there are ways to work with people with sub substance abuse issues and mental Sorry. health issues that allow them to participate in the community and address their challenges. And throwing them in prison for five or 10 or 20 years is not the solution. Yeah. And this is another place where finally many of our Republican uh, comrades are seeing that you know um, having people 50, 60 years old in, in prison at 25, 30 thousand dollars a year is not a very wise investment when we don't have money for public education and for, and for universities. And so there's an opportunity here to move this one forward. Yeah. And, and, and let's talk about taking some of those resources and working with communities where currently there's very little hope to see how do we build, get support the education, support the, the opportunities, address those challenges. So, so, so these communities, these young people can see, yes, I can make it right. in, in our society, in our community. Yeah, today's the 45th anniversary of the Attica Uprising. Um, so um, I think it's a very special time to think about that. What have we learned over all that time about incarceration and, right. and how we treat right. people and we, what we, we want we, to say. we actually have someone in our, in our group who knows a few things a little bit about this. Maybe Rod <laughs> would have some, but you actually study this. <laughs> well, the Don mentioned earlier, 
the mantra that I've often used is that social support prevents crime. Right. Uh, at every single level, if we're looking at nation states, at individual states mm -hmm. within the United States communities, the greater provision of social support tends to prevent crime. Uh, it addresses a lot of the economic inequalities and, and poverty that generate some of the conditions that lead to crime. And so, yes, when I hear someone like you saying Congress needs to be involved in making sound investments in education and health care and in helping to uh, create economic opportunity, those are, those are that's, those are policies that are anti-crime policies yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in the broadest sense possible. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left, so I want Paul to have sort of a last word here to kind of summarize where the campaign's at and to uh, let people know if they're interested in participating in your campaign, how they can get in touch with you and what, what they can do. Sure. Well, first I'll say is if you want to get more detail about my positions, take a look at my website, clementsforcongress.com. And... Um, this election is going to have enormous consequences for do we build a society and an economy that we all have a chance to, for we all have a chance to make it. We've got an economy that's rigged right now. Do we begin to turn that around or not? Um, and uh, if you want to work with my campaign, our our um, our office is just in the Jimmy John, just by the Jimmy John's restaurant at the base of the K College Hill on West Michigan Avenue, a couple blocks from University Roadhouse. Please come by. You know, this election, like most elections, will be determined by the turnout, by who comes out to vote. And um, unfortunately, we've seen that, that many of our young people, historically, have not always come out. Right. That yeah. um, uh, many people in, in our disadvantaged communities often have not come out. And if we can get out the vote for these issues that, that matter for our lives, for the lives of our young people, for the lives of our communities, for their future, their fu it's the future of, of the people of this district that's on the line, and that's what we need people to come out and express their will in the voting box for on November 8th. And whatever help pe com people can provide to allow that to happen, um, well, I think it'll probably help me for yeah, my campaign, yeah, yeah. but it's also what we need for our democracy. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. most definitely so. All right. Paul, thank you very much for being with us. Thank it's always you, Ron. a pleasure to have you on the program. Uh, Felix and Don, uh, good to be with you again. Uh, what we hope to do on our next program, by the way, is to focus on other elections that are going on. We know we've got the presidential campaign, we've got this congressional campaign. So these are at the top uh, where these are critical elections, but we also have a, a number of other elections that are going on. So we hope to focus on uh, John Fisher's race for state representative uh, mm -hmm. from Portage and uh, look at the Kalamazoo School Board yeah. uh, race. And uh, these elections at the lower levels, the local levels, are also critically important right. uh, for moving us forward to the, right. the kind of vision that Paul is articulating here. So Paul, again, thank you for being with us, and good luck for the rest of the campaign. And I'd like to thank you for joining us on Critical Issues, Alternative Views, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.